Uh, hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, this is the second study. I, I On the first one, I was able to get through chapter one and two. So if you did not see that, I hope you go back and watch that from the beginning. It's uh, available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I'm going to pick up now in chapter 3, and I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it first in the KJV, and then I'll also look at it in the Amplified, because the Amplified version uh, amplifies it, and sometimes I find that helpful. Okay, so let's begin. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. I'm going to stop at verse 8, and let's ponder that, discuss it. Um, I'm going to look at it more slowly in the Amplified verse by verse, but this is probably familiar to everybody. <laughs> even, even if you don't read the Bible, if you if you're not familiar with this from the Bible, you've probably heard this in songs. Um, there have been some fam famous uh, songs. I don't remember who recorded it, um, but these verses here have been turned into popular songs. Um, this is. Um, this is, well, it may seem a little bit repetitive it, to drive home the point. But well, let's look at it verse by verse. And the main thing we need to understand that is that uh, we need to realize that there is a proper time for everything. So let's go. Look at it in the Amplified, one verse at a time. There is a season, a time appointed for everything, and a time for every delight and event or purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Well, you've... If you're watching this now, you've satisfied that first time. You've been born. And you know there is a time to die for each of us. Have you ever thought about the first time you heard about death? Um, I don't know how old I was. Maybe, maybe you're a little child and you have a pet that dies or somebody in the family or that dies and, and you don't understand death and your parents first explain it to you. Uh, I have a, a video titled A Matter of Life and Death, where I, I go into this in great detail. But at a certain point in our lives, we're told the truth. Everybody is destined to die. So you've been born, and I've been born, but I was born twice. Have you been born once, or have you been born twice? You've got to be born twice. 
there's a saying that if you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you die just once. And that's talking about um, the, the second birth, the new birth, the spiritual birth, being born again as a child of God through faith in Jesus. That's the second birth. I was born November 19th, 1950 from my mother's womb. But I was born with a dead spirit because we all have a dead spirit. We've inherited it. It's part of our genetic code, you know. It's a birth defect we all have because of the fall of man. Um, so I'm walking around with a, a living body and a soul or mind, but a spirit that's dead. But in December of 1986, uh, I was born again, as Jesus had born from above, spiritually born. Uh, and my spirit was brought to life. It was quickened, regenerated. Uh, now my spirit's alive because the Holy Spirit of God has been united to my spirit and it's connected to God. That's the second birth. If you've never been born the second time, then this is the most urgent thing that you face in your life. You must be born again, Jesus said. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You get born again, simply by putting your faith in the life giver jesus christ he said i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me so he's the way to get to heaven he's the way to get eternal life he's the truth that you need to believe in he's the life that means he is the life giver the source of life the source of eternal life so you need to put your faith in him and then you you're reborn, you're born again, the new birth. So because I was born twice, I'll die one time. I don't know, I'm 65, maybe tonight or maybe 10 years from now or 20 or 30 years from now, I don't know, but we know it's coming. But after my one death, I'm promised a resurrection unto eternal life forever. I don't have to suffer what the Bible calls the second death. The second death is in the lake of fire where the lost people perish. Those people who never put their faith in Jesus Christ suffer the second death in the lake of fire. So there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. But between your birth and your death, you must be born again. Now, Let's go forward. It says a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. Planting could also be likened to building too. You plant something, you work at it, you water it, you want it to grow. And maybe that's also like a picture of our lives where we or building something, building a career, getting educated. This is planting, planting and uh, planning for the future. And then there's a time to uproot. Sometimes we have to decide that that particular plan in life is, is not the right plan and we need to uproot it and plant again and start over. Verse three says, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. Do you think there's a time to kill? The, a lot of people get confused uh, when they, they look at the Ten Commandments and they say, it says, uh, thou shalt not kill. But it really should say, thou shalt not murder. Murder is killing an innocent person. But killing is acceptable, as it says here. There is a time to kill. If, if, if I had to kill someone in self-defense or in defense of my family or a defense of an innocent person, if it was necessary to kill them, then that's the time to kill. 
Sometimes a war is justified. There is a time to kill people in war. Some wars are just, some are unjust. Some killing is unjust. So there is a proper time to kill and, a, and the wrong time to kill. And that says there's a time to heal. I don't know if there's a wrong time to heal, but we certainly know there, there is a time to heal. Perhaps it's all the time because we should always be open to healing, reconciliation, healing wounds, psychological wounds, emotional wounds, broken friendships, broken relationships. I think it's always the time to heal. It says, a time to tear down and a time to build up. I think that's like planting and uprooting. Uh, verse four, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. That's the same, the same point expressed two, two times, really. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, a time to dance. You know, I've always, not I should say always, but for much of my life, I, I've uh, not only um, been a Christian and, and, um, and because of that, I have peace and joy. I made a video earlier today about, don't worry, be happy. I'm talking about how I have peace and joy all the time. And uh, uh, that comes with my, with my faith, with my understanding of, of uh, Jesus's promise to me and my future. Um, but uh, even before that in my life, I, for many years, I've tried to adopt an attitude of positive thinking, a positive attitude about things. And even if something is a, a bad situation, I always try to put a, a positive spin on it or, or try to bring people from a, a, a a negative viewpoint to a positive viewpoint. But you know what, it's, as it says here in this verse, uh, sometimes it says there is a time to weep and a time to mourn. And it's a mistake for any of us to think that if we have a friend or family member or somebody who's weeping and mourning, maybe they've lost a loved one and we, we want to, we don't like to see them heartbroken. We don't want to see them weeping and mourning, mourning, they're, they're suffering. But there is a time for weeping and mourning. It's, it's proper. And if we try to pull them out of that, that's wrong. We need to allow that mourning and weeping from, for them. In fact, it would be improper for us to be laughing and dancing. When someone is mourning a loss, we don't want to laugh and dance in the middle of that. We need to join them in their weeping and their mourning. Empathize with them. Take on their weeping and mourning. Suffer with them. So there is a proper time for weeping and there's a time for laughing. And then it says in verse five, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Well, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing is uh, probably like the verse four, when it says there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and time to dance. We could also say there's a time to embrace, a time to refrain, but it's not exactly the same point. Embracing sometimes is there's a time to refrain from embracing, isn't there? Like for example, um, the gospel, the good news that Jesus offers salvation and eternal life in heaven to everyone is a free gift. Uh, this is a, a, a joyful, wonderful message, 
and it sometimes called the gospel of reconciliation how we we are reconciled with god because of jesus christ what he's done for us reconciliation is a beautiful thing but sometimes it's not proper to, to reconcile there are some people though that that uh, maybe they do something that you say, wait, we cannot reconcile, not at this point. There's something that has to happen before reconciliation can take place. And that is maybe the person needs to, you know, confess their wrong, ask for forgiveness, be repentant. That only then is it proper to, to reconcile. If you reconcile with someone when they're, they're still a serious uh, issue, until that issue is resolved, you should not reconcile. You need to resolve that issue. And then the reconciliation, then the embrace. You can embrace them again. But it says here in this verse, there is a time to embrace and a time to refrain. So I'd say the time to refrain is uh, we always want to embrace, but if there's an issue, you've got to resolve the issue before you embrace. And you've never addressed the problem. Address the problem, reconcile, get that straightened out, and then you can embrace and reconcile. In verse 6, it says, A time to search and a time to give up as lost. Time to search. We got to know when. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Um, to, to, a, a time to search and a time to give up is lost. Um, I think we just need to recognize when, when a situation, when it's lost. We need to understand Okay, we've done all that we can. Now we need to move on. Uh, we, we need to exhaust everything in our power bef before we reach that point, though. But once we've exhausted all of our efforts, we need to be recognized that it's time to move on. And then it says, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Maybe that's speaking about memories. And maybe that's time to keep think about conflicts with people. Sometimes we, we just need to throw away those memories. Some memories we want to keep, we want to hold on to, and we want to cherish them, we want to never forget. We don't want to never forget the people the people who have departed before us and, 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 and should we, do we want to just throw those memories away? No. But then there's a, some memories we should throw away. It's, these are the memories of when we have anger or hatred or conflicts in between people. Once you've reconciled, then the Bible says that as far as God and us, when we put our faith in Jesus, the Bible says God has cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. It says our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. So if we're going to be like God in that respect, then that's a time to, as it says here in the verse, it says, a time to throw away. Let's throw away those memories that are that are um, destructive. That are there's conflict. Once we we have forgiveness and reconciliation, let's not remember it again. Verse seven says, "A time to tear apart, and a time to sew together. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak." Well, um, tearing apart and sewing together, there's a footnote there. Let me look at that and see what it says. 
It says, this may be a reference to the practice of tearing one's clothes as a sign of mourning, which began early among the Hebrews. So if that's, if we apply it in that way, that would say, let me plug that in there. It says, there's a time to tear our clothes apart and in time to demonstrate that we're in mourning. And then there's a time to sew them together. I guess that would be a representative of, of the, the morning is over. You're ready to move on. It's like in verse six, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Okay, a, a time to search and a time to give up is lost. These things are saying that, hey, it's time to move on. Sew the garment back together. It's time to move on. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. Oh, God. Yeah, this is a this is a, learning. This one is a an issue with a lot of people. I I realize that sometimes sometimes we don't know what to say when we should say something. We and and it's, sometimes we say the wrong thing, uh, but sometimes it's best not to say anything at all. Uh, for example, this this morning you don't laugh. When your friend is mourning, you join them in mourning. You weep with them, and and rather than trying to say something to encourage them and make them feel better, no, it's, don't say anything at all. That's the time to say nothing. Just weep along with them. The last thing someone who is mourning wants to hear is some like you know positive thinking and, and uh, or <laughs> even even a verse verse from the Bible. Sometimes people just don't want to hear it. It's not the right time. Just weep along with them. And then it says, verse 8, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Well, a time for war and a time for peace is easy. Most people understand that sometimes it is necessary to go to war. There's a church um, uh, debates over the centuries, many, many centuries ago, that would, to determine, to come to, and they came to the conclusion that there is such a thing as a just war. Um, and a just war is just where you're doing it to in defense of yourselves of your nation or defense of somebody else who's being brutalized and murdered and conquered there are times to have a just war there is a time for peace and time it, it's always a time for peace until the time for war comes <laughs> it should always be the time for peace until you're confronted with warmongers terrorists conquerors then it's a time for war you've got to fight back but then it also says it's a time to love and a time to hate some people don't, don't realize or they they can't accept the fact that there is a time to hate for example uh, one of my videos that has had 10,000 views, more more views than most of my videos. Uh, and it's it's titled Lordship Salvation Liars. And in that video, I talk about righteous indignation, uh, righteous anger, anger, even hatred. There is a time to hate. We should hate evil. We should hate the uh, that someone is uh, uh, teaching lies about what the Bible says. Someone is perverting the gospel. These are things that it's it's a time to hate, and uh, that time to love is all other times. We should always love unless it becomes necessary to hate. And there are proper times for that. It says right here, there is a time for hate. Uh, 
now I'm going to that those are the most famous parts of this particular chapter and I'm going to read on now to in um, verse uh, nine in the KJV I'll go back to the KJV now it says what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth well that's the way that's written the grammar of that is very confusing to me let me look at it in the uh, in the amplified verse 9 in the amplified says what profit is there for the worker from from that in which he labors Um, I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. That's verse 10. So it's saying, what profit is there for the worker from that in which he labors? That's a very wordy way, and I think, of saying uh, what profit is there in all our labors? Why do we labor? Is there profit in our labors? And then verse 10 says in the KJV, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. The travail. Travail is something that's extremely laborious and difficult. Verse 10, the Amplified says, I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. Well, what is that task? What's the task with which God has given us to occupy ourselves? I would think the task, first of all, is to recognize our need for God. That's the first most important task. Uh, that's uh, the what what uh, Paul wrote in Timothy. He wrote uh, wisdom unto salvation. That's the first thing that you need to do: be wise enough to recognize your need for salvation. And so that's the first task: recognize your need, get saved, be born again, be a child of God be guaranteed your place in heaven and then that then it, the work begins not that you've got to to work to be get saved or or just keep your salvation or to even prove that you're truly saved but if you're wise once you get saved you want to get busy working for god because it's a joy it's a privilege and there's great blessings in it and as we grow and mature in our understanding of the scriptures and in, in our grow in our spiritual maturity, then uh, working for God is not laborious, it's joyful. What I'm doing right now is a work, but I don't consider it laborious. At 7, p 7 p.m. I started this broadcast. I do that almost every night at 7 p.m. I don't, I'm not doing it because I'm obligated or required to do it. I'm doing it because I have the privilege of talking about Jesus and the Bible every night on the internet. So this is, I think, what we need to understand from this verse, verse 10. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. It's kind of like the verse 10 in uh, Ephesians. You've got 2, 8, and 9, and then verse 10. Uh, 8 and 9 says, for by grace are we saved through faith. In other words, because God is gracious, we can be saved through faith in Jesus. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. Salvation is not of ourselves. It's not because of what we do. Not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's a gift from Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus, he gives us eternal life as a gift. It's not of works, it says. We don't work for it and earn it in any way. We just receive it through faith. Jesus worked for it. He lived a perfect, sinless life and then gives us credit for his perfection. And he paid for it. 
and bought it with his blood, suffering and death on the cross, and he gives it to us. So he worked for it, he paid for it, he gives it to us as a gift. And this, the scripture says, so that no one can boast. I can't bo boast that I'm going to heaven because of what I did. I haven't done anything to earn it, but I can boast in Jesus and what he's done for me. And he gets all the glory because he did the work. He bought it and paid for it. He gets all the glory. I get no glory. I just get the, 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 the joy of receiving the gift and the promise of eternal life. But in verse 10, it says that God has planned works for us to do that we should do. He has planned works for us, a ministry. Every time someone puts their faith in Jesus and they, they get born again and they're a child of God and they're guaranteed a place in heaven, from that moment, you should ask God, well, what do you want me to do? And, and then get busy doing it. We all have a ministry. We're all expected to serve God. We're not required to, but we should be doing it. We should be busy doing it. And if you get busy doing it, you'll find out that it's not laborious. It's, it's not burdensome. It's a joy. It's a privilege. So I think in verse 10, that's how I would say verse 10 uh, applies. Verse 11 says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. All right, let me let me read that verse 11 in the Amplified here. Verse 11 in the Amplified says, uh, oh, by the way, there's a subtitle here in the Amplified, starting with verse 11. It says, the subtitle is, God set eternity in the heart of man. Um, the Bible says that um, no person has an excuse for not believing because the creation tells us that there is a creator. And it says here that uh, eternity is uh, in, in the heart of man. In other words, we should understand there's something happens something more after we die. There's something more, there's eternity. What happens after we die? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? That's really what the book of Ecclesiastes is going to tell us. It's not fame, it's not fortune, it's not acquiring pleasures, it's a relationship with God. That's really the purpose. Everything else, it says, is vanity in comparison. So verse 12 in the KJV says, I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is, is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God required requireth that which is past. I'm going to read that in the Amplified, see how that explains it. Verse 15 says, That which is has already been, and that which will be has already been. For God seeks that which uh, God seeks what has passed by so that history repeats itself. Well, that was also a point that was I discussed in, in chapter one, too, that history does repeat itself. It's a cycle. We, we live 70 years, more or less, and we die, and then, and, but there's always someone left to take our place, and the, and the uh, humanity continues on. And sometimes we, we learn from our ancestors, we learn from history, sometimes we don't when we repeat it. Uh, now verse um, 
16 in the KJV. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time uh, there for every purpose and for every work. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Beasts, creatures. Verse 19, for that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. We're born, we live, we die. Even one thing befalleth them as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? All right, I'm going to read that last portion in the, in the Amplified here. That last verse, it says, So I have seen that there is nothing better than that a man should be happy in his own works and activities, for that is his portion for who will bring him back to see what will happen after he is gone. So he's saying, be content in your labors, in your life, and uh, you're not going to come back and be able to reflect on it later. You know, just do the best you can now and enjoy life because you're not going to be able to come back and redo it or reflect on it after you die. And it say, he says that everybody's going to be judged, the good, the good and the, and the wicked. And that's true. And I, I, I guess that leads us right into this message about salvation. Uh, every broadcast I do, I, I want to reserve a few minutes to tell you uh, about salvation, to tell you good news, to tell you the gospel. Did you know the gospel? Gospel is a Greek word. It just means good news. Did you know that? If I want to tell you the gospel, that means I want to tell you the good news. Now, what is the good news? The good news is that even though none of us deserve to go to heaven, because to go to heaven, we'd have to be able to go before God and say, I've been perfect my whole life. Let me in. None of us can do that. So none of us deserve it. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. Now, some people think that God will let them in, even though they're, they, they have to admit they, they weren't perfect. But the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The standard God set for us to meet, if we want to be live forever in heaven, the standard is the glory of God. Jesus Christ set the bar he lived a perfect, sinless life, and the rest of us are way down here. The best of man, it says, the best of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So even though we cannot get to heaven through our own efforts, through our own goodness, the Bible says that heaven, eternal life, salvation, it's, all, it's offered to all of us as a free gift from Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's good news. That's that's the best news ever. And that, that's that's what I call biblical Christianity. It's not the kind of Christianity you hear in most churches in America or around the world. Most of them, you, you could never be happy to hear their message because they put you in yokes of bondage you think that you have to become religious and follow religious rules and, and uh, 
uh, keep your fingers crossed, hoping that you've done well enough. But that's not biblical Christianity. The Christianity we find in the Bible, it is free gift theology, free gift salvation. And that's what it says. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death because everybody sinned. Now I know some people sin more than others, but it's not the number of sins. It's just the fact that none of us are perfect. And I know that we all have our different varieties of sins. So one person's sins may be completely different than the other person's sins, but it's not the variety of sins either. It's just the fact that all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. We can't live forever in heaven because we've all sinned. But, the scripture says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if that doesn't make you happy and jump for joy to hear that even though we could never qualify for heaven because we can, none of us could go before God and say, I've been perfect my whole life. I've never done one thing wrong. None of us could make that claim, not, not honestly, not truthfully. So we're all disqualified. And yet Jesus says, I'll give you eternal life in heaven as a free gift. And he can do it because he died on the cross to pay for our sins. So the sin problem is resolved. He paid for our sins. And he, he was buried, truly dead for three days in the tomb. But on the third day, he was raised back to life, raised bodily. And it should be no surprise because in the scriptures, he promised a bodily resurrection numerous times. The Jews demanded a sign from him. And he says, the sign is destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. They said, it took 40 years to build the temple. How could you rebuild it in three days? And the scripture says, you know, he was talking about the temple of his body, his death, burial, and resurrection. Later on, they asked him again, demanding a sign. And he said, the only sign we'll give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Again, he was talking about his death burial and resurrection he promised that he would be raised back to life bodily as a sign to prove his claims were true what were his claims he claimed that he is god almighty manifested in the flesh as the son of god jesus christ he claimed that he was the savior he would solve our sins problem by paying for them on the cross he promised he would be raised from the dead and that would be the proof that his claims were true that he does have power over life and death. When he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he say, I'm the way to heaven, the only way. I'm the truth you need to believe. I'm life. I'm the sole source of life everlasting. So this uh, death, burial, and resurrection, it, he paid for our sins, and he proved he has power over life and death. So that gives me confidence that I can trust him. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to trust him. When it says believe in Jesus, believe on Jesus, it means trust him. Reject the idea that you could somehow get to heaven on your own and go to God and say, I'm good enough. You reject that, that's impossible. Instead, trust Jesus, depend on Jesus, rely on Jesus, have confidence in Jesus. If you do, he promises you you're going to go to heaven. Now, the Bible says God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. So it's a guarantee. And you should be, be so happy because if you put your faith in Jesus, you're guaranteed you're going to heaven. I hope you'll do it now. And uh, that'll be the end of the study for tonight. I'll, I'll pick up in Ecclesiastes uh, uh, chapter 4 next time. Uh, I hope you will join me nightly for these broadcasts live at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.